Mr. Teru, in this video and in the next, we're going to do a total of uh, six examples dealing with optimization in calculus. The first video, which we're doing right now, is going to be dealing with three problems dealing with uh, some form of length. We're going to have a rectangle with a fixed area, and we're going to minimize the perimeter of that rectangle and still withhold that fixed area within it. We're going to find the minimum distance between a point and a parabola, a point that's not on the parabola, and the parabola itself. And we're also going to, in some form, be minimizing the uh, length of the hypotenuse of a right triangle, given some other information about it on the coordinate system, coordinate plane. The next video is going to be dealing with three questions of volume. But this video is just about working with measures of length and finding maxim uh, maximize or minimize values. To do that, we're going to walk through these steps. We're going to identify all the variables of interest. What, um, what's been given? What ultimately are you trying to solve for? And these are geometry questions, so draw yourself a picture. It's going to help you understand where the numbers belong, what they represent. It's going to help you uh, probably uh, come up with a reasonable domain for your question. Uh, and you'll understand what I'm talking about that here in a second. We're going to set up a primary equation based on what do you want to maximize or minimize. Our first example we'll do in a second, I want to minimize the perimeter. So that's going to be my primary equation is going to be about the perimeter of this rectangle enclosing a fixed area. We're going to have a second equation based on a fixed value, and we're going to use the information from that equation to allow us to rewrite the primary equation in terms of only one variable, so that we can apply the derivative to it, uh, which you can apply the derivative to functions that have more than just one variable in it, but you know, we want to be able to solve it, uh, find some critical values, and allow us to find some maximized and minimized values. That's why we need it in terms of one variable. And I just kind of got ahead of myself there a little bit. We're going to solve those primary equations within a reasonable domain. And that can be, uh, we can help come up with that reasonable domain uh, from that picture that we drew. And then we're going to, you know, uh, determine what the max, you know, what values are going to maximize or minimize whatever question is being asked. So, let's get that first example right now. Find the length and width of a rectangle that has an area of 108 square units. And we want to minimize the perimeter. What's the minimum perimeter that can withhold that area of 108? OK, now some of these questions, as we get done, and they're going to be you know, fairly lengthy, you might be going, well, I could have just seen that in the first place. You know, like maybe you already have an idea of what shaped perimeter, or excuse me, what shaped rectangle would be most efficient for holding that area of 108. But, you know, I mean, every time we learn something new, we start easy and we get into more difficult, more difficult, more difficult questions. So, even if you think you know the answer to this before you even start, you know, we need to walk through the process and get the door. Okay, got the door, and we have a rectangle up here now all of a sudden. It's got a uh, length of, uh, or width of x and a length of y, or vice versa. Doesn't really much matter. And our secondary equation, what information do we have that's fixed? Well, it says here that we have an area of 108 square units. So if area is base times height or length times width, then we have 108 is you know, equal to x, y. OK, so we'll need that information here in a minute. Because we're not asked to maximize or minimize the area. So that's not our primary equation. It's a secondary one. What we want to minimize is the perimeter. Now, the perimeter of a rectangle is equal to 2x plus 2y, or whatever variable your particular problem is using. And, well, that's fine and dandy, but it's not in terms of one variable. So when we go to find critical values and, and, and trying to find the intervals that are going to maximize and minimize that, it's going to be a problem. So now that's where we get into the step where we take our secondary equation and we rewrite it in a way that's going to allow us to, as easily as possible, get it substituted into our primary equation, that's what this is, and uh, you know, get it written in terms of one variable. And just manipulate this however you like, what you feel is the simplest uh, uh, way of getting this substituted into your primary equation. Uh, but in this case, we have 2x and 2y. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. It doesn't really matter what we do. Uh, it's not going to be any easier one way or the other. So we're just going to divide both sides by x and get 108 divided by x is equal to y. OK, so now I'm going to take this piece of information, and I'm going to substitute it into our primary equation. And we're going to get p of x, or the perimeter in terms of x. I can say that now, because I'm going to take the y out and replace it with 108 over x. OK, 
Okay, so now we've got uh, 2 times 108 is 216. over x, and that's p of x. Now, a reasonable domain for this function. Well, x now is the width of this rectangle, and you know I can take this width and close it to be just anything greater than zero. Of course, it's going to be a really, 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 really long rectangle to hold that area of 108, so I don't think that's the most efficient uh, setup uh, to minimize the perimeter for that fixed uh, area, but the domain, a reasonable domain, or just the domain. Actually, it is a reasonable domain because we're dealing with geometry, right? I mean, this is a function where, we're divide, where we have a division of x. So really, if I just look at that function, the domain would be all real numbers, except x can't be equal to 0. Well, a reasonable domain for this word problem, this geometry problem, is we can't have a negative measurement. So our reasonable domain is from 0 to infinity. OK, so I want to minimize that perimeter. Okay, minimize. That means that we want to find the first derivative, and you can use the second derivative if it's appropriate or if it um, allows you to solve the problem a little bit easier, but I'm going to probably do most of these questions with, with just the first derivative test. We want to find the derivative, find the critical values, find the intervals where the function is increasing or decreasing, and then use that to identify relative max or mins. So our derivative of this is p hat, or excuse me, p hat. Uh, p prime, or the derivative of p of x, is equal to, well, 2x is going to be just become 2. And I can rewrite this, or just temporarily think of this, as 216 times x to the negative 1 to bring that up. So uh, negative 1 times 216 is negative 216 times x to the negative 2, because I need to reduce that exponent by 1. Or we can write this as 2 minus 216 over x squared, and that's p prime of x. Okay, so now I want to find the critical values, which means I need to find out where my first derivative is equal to zero. Okay, well, <clears throat> I'm going to do that by doing, um, let's see here, 2 minus 216 over x squared is equal to zero. We're going to subtract both sides by 2 and get negative 216 over x squared is equal to negative 2. We can multiply both sides by negative 1 or divide both sides by negative 1 to get that exponent out of there. Now I have x in the denominator, so I can get that out of the denominator by multiplying both sides by x squared. So we have 216 equals 2x squared. Divide both sides by 2. And we get back to 108 is equal to x squared. And now we need to apply the square root function to both sides of the equation you know, to solve for x. So x is equal to the square root of 108. Now, I'm not, I introduced my own even root, but I'm not including both the positive and negative answer because, again, the x is the length of a rectangle. And again, it wouldn't be part of our reasonable domain here, so it wouldn't make any sense to say that. But So x is equal to uh, the square root of 108. There is a perfect square in this. It's 36, so it's going to be equal to the square root of 36 times the square root of 3, and the square root of 36 is 6. Square root of 3. Now, <clears throat> so that's one critical value. That's the, that's, 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 what, that's the x value that makes the first derivative equal to 0. The other critical value, of course, don't forget, is we need to make sure that first derivative, what makes it undefined? Well, p hat, where it's equal to be undefined, is, well, we do have a rational function, and you can't divide by 0. So it's undefined when the denominator of our uh, rational expression is 0. Well, actually, there's nothing left to solve there, is there? Now, 0 is going to be another critical value. And if this were a normal non-application problem, then I would, I would set up my intervals going from negative infinity to 0, and then from 0 to 6 squared to 3, and then from 6 squared to 3 off to infinity. But back to our reasonable domain, and the fact that this is a measurement problem, you can't have a negative measurement. So my intervals that I'm going to check are from 0 to 6 squared to 3, and then from 6 squared to 3, 
you know, till again, I could just extend this off, just like I could, I could let this X approach zero and have a very tall, skull, uh, tall skinny rectangle, I can extend that forever and just basically have a practically flat rectangle as well. Don't think that'd be very efficient either for the um, minimizing the perimeter. But, <clears throat> okay, so now if I take a value like, if I take a value like one, that's between zero and six square root of three, and put it into the first derivative, I'm going to have two minus 216 divided by one squared, which is going to be one, and 216 divided by one is 216, so two minus <laughs> quite a big number is going to be negative. So the first derivative is negative in this interval, which means that it is, you know, dec it's a decreasing function between zero and six squared of three. Now, if I take a number uh, that's bigger than that, let's just make sure I pick something much bigger, like, I don't know, 20, um, <clears throat> and plug it into my first derivative, I'm going to have 2 minus 216 over 20 squared, which is 400. Now, 216 divided by 400 is clearly going to be, well, less than 1. So 2 minus a number that's less than 1, positive 2, that's going to come out to be positive. So within this interval, the first derivative is positive. That means the function is increasing, and I'm running out of room, so let me just get this out of the way, which means that we have a relative min at this, func at this value of 6 square root of 3, f square root of 3. Lots of parentheses, <laughs> I need a parentheses there. Now, can't do that quite off the top of my head. If I take that um, Excuse the pause there, I was starting to say that I was going to refer to my notes and use some kind of decimal for my calculator, but I forgot that I attempted to make sure this worked out relatively easily. So let's go ahead and find out that relative min. Let's take that 6 square to 3 and, and actually work it out by hand and find the perimeter, or P of 6 square root of 3, is going to be equal to, let's see here, well that's going to be 2 times x, which is going to be 2 times 6 square root of 3, plus 216 over 6 square root of 3. Okay, now, well, 2 times 6 is 12. And 216 divided by 6, uh, let's see here, 21 divided by 6 is 3, 18, that leaves you with 36, so it's going to be uh, actually 36 over square root of 3, right? Off the top of my head? Yes, okay. Now, rationalizing this, we're going to get the square root of 3 out of the numerator, or out of the denominator, excuse me. And when we get done, get done simplifying this, we have 12 square root of 3. Since I paused the video, I should have planned my spacing out a little bit better. Square root of 3 times square root of 3 is 3, and 36 divided by 3 is 12. And then finally, we have 12 plus 12 is... So p of 6 square root of 3 is 12 square root of 3 units. That's our perimeter. Now, is, that prim is it reasonable to think that, you know, our first derivative test showed that that was a relative minimum, but, it is, but is it the minimum perimeter to hold this area of 108? Well, you can't just check the... Um, the critical values where the first derivative is zero undefined, you also need to check the, the minimum and maximum values of your uh, reasonable domain, which I guess I just erased, was from zero to infinity. It doesn't really make any sense. Well, first of all, it's not a closed um, interval, so I can't really just test zero. I have to test infinitely close to zero. And, you know, does that really make any sense, though? Like, we see here that as we, as we let x approach 0, that's going to become infinitely tall. And actually, the function here for area being 108, uh, I can't let x equal 0, right? It becomes undefined. So we don't need to test um, the minimum and maximum values here of our reasonable domain. And we can be assured that this 12 square to 3 square uh, units is our minimum perimeter that is going to hold this area of 108. Okay, well, <clears throat> now that I'm, I'm happy with that, we have a length, we have the 6 square root of 3 
for x, we need to find, we were asked to find the dimensions, not just one of the measurements. So now that we know what x is, we're going to go back up here and say, well, y is equal to 108 divided by 6 square root of 3. And <clears throat> that is going to come out to be, let's see here, um, how many 6's are in 10? 1. Okay, so that's going to be 1. Uh, that's going to leave me with the remainder of 4. 48. 48 divided by 6 is 18 over square root of 3. And we want to rationalize this denominator. So square root of 3 on the top and bottom or numerator and denominator. Square root of 3 times square root of 3 is 3. And 18 divided by 3 is 6. So y is equal to 6 square root of 3. Now, way in the, back, <laughs> the beginning of this problem, I said you might know the answer before you even start. It appears that when the length x and the width y are both the same measurement, or if this rectangle is a square, that's the most efficient um, shape, in rectangular world anyway, to withhold an area, or to hold an area of 108 square units. Now, if you thought it was going to be a square before you even started, that's awesome, good spatial uh, sense, but this is how the calculus comes up to the solution, and uh, you know, we'll have some questions that are hard enough to where you can't just see the answer before you start. <laughs> Next example! Find the point on the graph of the function that is closest to the given point. Our function is going to be f of x is equal to x minus 5 squared minus 1. And this is basically in vertex or standard form of a parabola, which means that if I move to the right 5 and down 1, I will find the vertex. And our leading coefficient out here is positive, so it's opening up. Well, it's opening up or down because it's the x that has been squared. Okay, and our fixed point is negative 1, 2, which I have plotted right here. Now, if you remember from probably the end of Algebra 1 or the beginning of Algebra 2 when you were studying solving linear systems, uh, you had questions similar to this, only it was, here's a point, here's a line, find the distance from that point to that line. Now, the shortest distance between a point and a line, and it's going to be true still with a parabola, is, well, let's see. I don't think that's right. Mm, nope, don't think that's right. No, of course, it's a perpendicular line. So now the first way we do this problem, I'm not going to be focusing on that property but being perpendicular, but I'm actually going to show you an alternative way or two ways of solving the same question. So really I said we were going to do three examples. I guess you could kind of argue it's really four in this video. So the shortest distance between a point and a line is a perpendicular line segment. Okay, so and then you had to, you know, maybe you had to find the equation of this, um, this line segment and do uh, had the equation of this line originally, and you found out with the linear systems, either substitution or uh, the elimination method, the intersection point between that line segment and your line, and then you did the distance formula. Okay, so that's how we're going to do the first way, or the first method of solving this question, is we're going to use the distance formula. Now, <clears throat> I try to do a pretty accurate sketch, and keep it on this idea that the distance is going to be perpendicular, You know, and it'll be perpendicular to the tangent line of that uh, parabola at some particular point. It seems like I, I, I've tried to draw this somewhat accurately, so when I'm done with the question, you know, I can use the drawing to test the reasonableness of my solution. Uh, and it looks like it should be somewhere around, uh, somewhere around three three. So let's see how that goes. Okay, I want to set up a secondary equation and a fixed equation. Really, this I was kind of given my secondary equation. This is the, the shape of the, or the function itself, the parabola. What I want to minimize the closest to is the distance. So that's my primary equation. Uh, distance, of course, is equal to the square root of x of 2 minus x of 1 squared plus y2 minus y sub 1 squared. All right, well, what do you need to find the distance? You need two points. Well, one point is given, this, this uh, negative 1 and this 2. So we have the, di the distance is equal to the square root of x 
sub 2 minus x sub 1, which is going to be negative 1, minus y sub 2, minus y sub 1, well here's the y my point, which is 2, squared. Okay, and to clean this up a little bit, I'm going to drop those subscripts of uh, x sub 2 and y sub 2 here in a second. So I have a distance d, which is equal to the square root of you know, what I've written here. Uh, now, that's fine, but, and I'll fix that double negative there in a second. But my equation, again, is in two variables. And normally, uh, you will find in these problems that your primary equation, what you want to maximize or minimize, will be in two variables. So we're going to rewrite this with the function. I mean, like, you know, after all, if I asked you to graph this parabola and you had no idea about, you know, standard form and I placed the vertex and, you know, maybe you know something about lattice rectum and you, or you test a couple of points to sort of see what the graph is going to look like. If you had no idea, you would just do a t-table, right? You would pick some x's, you would take those x's, you would plug them in to the function and get some y. So y is equal to x minus 5 squared minus 1. So I've got already a natural replacement to write my primary function in terms of only one variable. I'm relating the function that I'm trying to find the distance to into the distance formula. So we have the square root of x plus 1 squared plus, now my y is coming out, and we have x minus 5 squared minus 1 minus 2 squared. This is what I need to clean up, and that's going to take some algebra, so I'm going to pause and just walk off and reveal the answer in small steps to speed this up a little bit. I'm going to clean this up. Then we're going to you know, work with the first derivative test, and maybe even with this one, go do the second derivative test to find, uh, identify some relative max and mins. Now, what is a reasonable domain for this? <clears throat> well, I have a parabola on the x-y axis, so an x is the x-coordinate, basically, of this point that's going to give me this distance, right? This is my point here of negative 1, 2, and these x values are the x values along this parabola. The equation of the parabola is right there. So my reasonable domain for my, my variable here is really negative infinity to positive infinity. So um, let's get this cleaned up, find the first, um, into a form that we can easily find the first derivative and then start applying those tests and see where we can find uh, the minimized value. And I'm going to reveal this in steps. If you want to practice your algebra, you can pause and try it on your own. All right, so the distance is equal to the square root of x to the fourth minus 20x cubed plus 145x squared minus 438x plus 485. Now we want to minimize this uh, distance. Now to minimize this distance, uh, I can avoid or, or just really focus on the inside function and not bring in that square root, not, not worry about it as I find the first derivative. It's just going to complicate things. If I minimize this polynomial, then I'm going to minimize the distance. So I'm going to find the first derivative, which is going to be, bring that 4 down. We got 4x uh, cubed. We got negative 20 times 3, which is negative 60 x squared. We've got 145 times 2, which is 290 x, and then minus 438. Now, the critical values, where is this equal to 0? Okay, well, where is the first derivative equal to 0? That means that we're going to take this and set it equal to 0 and get 4x cubed minus 60x squared plus 290x minus 438. And we're setting that equal to 0. Now, all of these numbers are even, so I can divide them all by 2 and get 2x cubed minus 30x squared plus 145x minus 2, 1, 19 equals 0. Okay. Whoops. Yeah, never mind. All right. Now, this is a higher order polynomial. <sighs> yeah. So, if you are in a class that's not allowing you to use your calculators at all, um, I don't want to review that, but that is these, uh, 
the rational zero theorem, you might need to you know, take all of your factors of your constant and set them over or divide them by all the factors of the numerator, set all of those possibilities out, and use with Descartes' rule to kind of speed up the process a little bit. You could do your synthetic division until you found a, um, a possible rational zero that gives you a remainder of zero um, after you do the synthetic division to find one of your real rational zeros. Now, if you don't have any real zeros, that's a problem, uh, or rational, excuse me, rational zeros. Um, so, I'll be honest, I just put this in my calculator, uh, made a graph, and, you know, found the root where it intersected the, um, the x-axis. So, it depends on, you know, how much work is involved to uh, solve this in your class, especially if you're not using calculators. And I wasn't very careful about making sure these numbers stayed small to walk through that rational zero uh, theorem process with you. So, I just kind of cheated a little bit, used my calculator, and found that my solution to this, where my first derivative is equal to zero, is x equals three. Now, where is the first derivative undefined? Well, <clears throat> this is a polynomial. There's not, you know, its domain is all real numbers, so we're not going to find any issues or find any solutions to where that first derivative is undefined. So this is my only critical value. Now, now in the last video, I did the first derivative test to see if this was a relative max or min. Uh, and I can do that here as well, but I want to show you the second derivative test just to show you something different. So, <clears throat> if my second derivative, well, what is my second derivative? Well, my first derivative is 4x cubed minus, you know, well, it's right here, right? So my second derivative is going to be, or d double prime, is going to be, bring the 3 down, 3 times 4 is 12x squared. We have 2 times 60, which is negative 120x and then plus 290. Okay. Is it plus, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so now at x equals 3, my first derivative is equal to 0. So if my second derivative at the x value of 3 is positive, then my function is concave up and we have a relative min at 3. If my second derivative at 3 ends up being negative, then we have a concave down situation, which means this is a relative max, and we're trying to minimize the distance, so hopefully that's not the case. And if the second derivative comes out to be zero, well, I'm going to have to, go back, to, have to revert back to the first derivative uh, test for relative max or min, but I'm pretty sure this is going to come out okay. So <clears throat> d double prime of 3 is going to be 12 times 3 squared minus 120 times 3 plus 290. Okay, uh, 3 squared is 9, and 9 times 10 is 90, 9 times 2 is 18, so 90 and 18 is 108. We have 120 times 3, which is negative 360, and we have plus 290. So, my second derivative, 108 plus 290 is greater than 360, so this is going to come out to be positive. I don't really care what the actual number is. I just care about whether the second derivative is positive or negative, and it's positive, so our function is concave up, and that means we have a relative min at 3. So we have a relative min at 3, f of 3. Okay, take that function and or that value and plug it up here. Actually, kind of already have the answer up here, sorry about that. We're going to take the value of 3. Plug it into our function, 3 minus 5 is negative 2, negative 2 squared is 4, and 4 minus 1 is 3. So, three comma 3, is the point on the parabola which has the shortest distance, the closest distance to the outside point of negative 1, 2 that we were given. And thankfully, the drawing that I made, I attempted to make it as accurate as possible, is checking the reasonableness of our answer. Now, it's not checking the exact you know, accuracy of the answer, it's just a sketch, but it's reasonable. So, that is the answer to our question. The function at 3, 3 is as close as you're going to get to that point of negative 1, 2. Now, this method, obviously, dealt with the distance formula. Uh, before we get on to our, our, our third completely different example, I'd like to, see, uh, like to show you what this would look like if you had focused on making sure that, that sl these slopes were perpendicular, kind of like we did in Algebra 1, at the end of Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, because there's another way of looking at this problem. Oh, when I show you the other solution, I'm not going to completely finish it. 
uh, I'll be stopping and going, hey, does this look familiar? Uh, we're going to get to a point where you're going to start to see this, this polynomial here start to show up again, and you can see the, how the two different solutions start coming together and giving us the same answer at the end. Okay, slope. Well, how do you find the slope of a parabola along pretty much any point uh, that you can differentiate it at? And with a parabola, it's going to be everywhere. Well, that's derivative. So if f of x is equal to x minus 5 squared minus 1, then f prime of x is going to be equal to, using the chain rule, 2 times x minus 5. Uh, reduce that exponent by 1, this is going to be a 0, and we're using a chain rule, so we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function, which the derivative of x minus 5 is just 1, so it kind of doesn't seem like we're doing chain rule, and our uh, slope of the parabola, f prime of x, is equal to 2x minus 10. Okay, well I have the slope of the parabola uh, that I can find, you know, along anywhere that I'd like on this parabola. Now let's deal with the slope of this line segment. Now, <clears throat> you know, I can find the slope between this point of negative 1, 2 and any point along the parabola. Really, I could pick a point here, point here, point here, wherever, right? So, slope is equal to, you know, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And our fixed point out here is negative 1, 2, so we have y minus uh, the y of our point, which is 2, over x minus negative 1. Okay, but I don't want to find the slope between this point and just any old point along the parabola. Uh, we know from Algebra 1, at the end of Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, that the, the closest distance between a point and a line, we said then, was a perpendicular distance, so I want a perpendicular slope. So our perpendicular slope then, well, how do you find perpendicular slopes? It's opposite reciprocal. So we want to take this fraction and flip it and get x minus one or x plus one over y minus two and change the sign. So our <clears throat> perpendicular slope is equal to, now let's go ahead and distribute this negative one. So negative x minus 1 over y minus 2. And sometimes talking and thinking at the same time is a little difficult for me, so let's just make sure I'm totally happy with this. Uh, yes, okay. So, now, I want that perpendicular slope. You know, I need to relate these together, right? I want the slope of the parabola to be perpendicular, and, you know, I want it to be perpendicular to this slope, so I'm going to set them equal to each other now, and get 2x minus 10 is equal to that perpendicular slope of, <clears throat> again, this here is this slope, and I want it perpendicular to the slope of the parabola, so we have negative x minus 1 over y minus 2. Okay, so we well, can start solving that, right? But I've got an equation, this is really like my primary equation, where it's written in two um, variables. So I'm going to take this y out and replace it with what I know y is equal to in the original problem or the original information, that parabola. So we have 2x minus 10 is equal to negative x minus 1 over y, and then in its place we have x minus 5 squared minus 1 minus 2. And we're going to solve that for x. And you can see there's going to be a lot of algebraic cleaning up here to do, so I'm going to step off and reveal it in stages like before. So, we found the slope of the parabola using derivative. We found the slope of this uh, line segment. Uh, just set up the general old uh, slope formula and then made sure that it was perpendicular. Set them equal to each other. Started solving through this. 
and 2x cubed to minus 30x plus 145x minus 219 equals 0 is the same equation that we got when we were taking the derivative uh, method or the distance method and we were setting the first derivative equal to 0, we had that as same equation, so this will again come out to be x is equal to 0, and then we'll have to show that it's a relative minimum and so on, but it's starting to blend back into the previous uh, method that we just showed. Very, very cool! Bam! Next example! I love this stuff! <coughs> Last example! A right triangle in the first quadrant has the coordinates axis as the sides, and uh, the hypotenuse passes through the point of 2, 7, find the vertices of the triangle that minimize the length of the hypotenuse. Well, when we're dealing with right triangles, uh, you know, the vast majority of the time, unless we're doing trigonometry or a little right triangle trig, uh, Sokotoa and all that good stuff, uh, we're dealing with Pythagorean theorem. So we have c squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. And the length of the hypotenuse is c, so c can be written as the square root of x squared plus y squared. But to minimize the length of the hypotenuse, I can, I can use the square root, but that's going to complicate matters. I can really just focus in on that inside function and minimize x squared plus y squared. Uh, so I'm going to just keep it as c squared is equal to x squared minus y squared and focus on minimizing that expression right there. Which, unfortunately, right now, and this is our primary function, or it will be in a second, uh, I'll give it a function name when we get it in one variable. But it has two variables. It's in terms of x and y. So now we need to focus on the fact that the, the hypotenuse is passing through this point of 2, 7. You can go, oh, well, I can see, uh, I can figure out the distance between 0y and 2, 7. Or I can find the slope between 0y or with 0y uh, and 2, 7, which is what I'm going to focus on. And uh, let's just do that. We have this slope, which we'll call m, is equal to oh, y minus 7 over 0 minus 2. Great! So I can... Hmm. I can do what? I can't find the slope. Uh, you might think, well, let's just get the solve for y and plug it into this equation, but do I want to use... An, do I want the variable m in here? Right? So that's not really enough. Uh, because, and, and, and as well, I need to find coordinates of x and y. So I can't just focus on this slope. I need to focus on the entire hypotenuse. Well, this hypotenuse is supposed to be a straight line, right? And it doesn't matter what two points you use to find the slope of a line, you're supposed to get the same answer. So let's call this m sub 1, and we'll call this over here m sub 2. Well, m sub 2, uh, where am I going to put it? How about over here? m sub 2 is equal to, now that not only is going to allow us to work with the entire length of the hypotenuse, but of course bring in the variable of x. So we have x minus 2, or excuse me, well, got to do the change of y over change of x. So 0 minus 7 over x minus 2. Okay, now, this is again, these slopes are supposed to be equal. So now I've got a way of relating the variable y with the variable of x, and I'm going to put this together, and that will allow me to get into this function which describes the length of the hypotenuse, and that'll get us into one variable. So this slope of y minus 7 over negative 2 can be set equal to negative 7 over x minus 2. And, you know, I can get this in turn, I can get this y in terms of x or x in terms of y, whatever you feel is simplest. I'm going to get y in terms of x, so I'm going to multiply both sides by negative 2 and get y minus 7 is equal to, if I take negative 2, move it over to the other side of the equation, don't forget the negative sign, negative 2 times negative 7 is 14 over x minus 2. I'm going to run out of room, <laughs> so I'll just do this work and then clean it up here in a second. We're going to add 7 to both sides and get y is equal to 14 over x minus 2 plus 7. I think it'd be a little bit easier if I can get this in one term to get it substituted into the other function. So I'm going to go ahead and find a common denominator by multiplying the numerator and denominator by x minus 2. That's going to be y is equal to 14 plus, let's just get this all together at once, um, 
7 times x is a positive 7x, and positive 7 times negative 2 is a negative 14. Over, we have x my, our common denominator of x minus 2. And that means that y is equal to 7x over x minus 2. So I'm going to clean up this algebra, erase it, and get it just back over here in one piece so I have room to finish the rest of the problem as soon as I get my remote in my hand. Okay, so using those slopes which are equal, allowing me to incorporate that x and y coordinate with the point that the hypotenuse of our right triangle must pass through, we get y in terms of x, y equals 7x over x minus 2. Okay, so now that secondary equation will allow me to rewrite my primary equation in terms of only one variable. So we have c squared is equal to x squared plus 7x over x minus 2 squared. And we're going to go ahead and let uh, this f of x equal c squared, which is equal to x squared plus basically y squared, or Pythagorean theorem. And again, um, dot, you know, again, like I said, I'm not bringing in that c equals the square root of, just to simplify my algebra, because if I minimize the inside of the radical, I minimize the distance. So we'll just focus on this. And we get f of x is equal to x squared um, plus 7x squared is going to be 49 x squared over, and I'm going to save myself some work by actually not uh, distributing out the x minus 2 and just write it as x minus 2 squared. Okay, well, we have finally our primary function written in terms of only one variable. So, that means we need to find the first derivative, and that's coming right up. I'm going to just, again, we're going to involve the chain rule a little bit. We need to use the quotient rule. Uh, so just going to speed this up a little bit, step out, reveal this in small steps, practice your skills as well as finding those derivatives. Okay, so we got our first derivative. Uh, let's see here. Applying the quotient rule was derivative times the, or the denominator, excuse me, times the derivative of the numerator, uh, minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator using the chain rule, 2 times x minus 2, and then dropping that exponent by 1. And I, I am multiplying by the derivative of the inside function, but the derivative of x minus 2 is just multiplied by 1. And then the denominator is squared. Now again, if you leave all this in factored form, then we see that the first uh, term here has an x minus 2 squared, or a common factor of x minus 2, and our second term has an x minus 2 as well. So I pulled that out. That, le that left me with x minus 2 to the first power, and just left the 2 over here by itself. Did a, little bit uh, did a bit more distributive uh, property, canceled that x minus 2 with the denominator, uh, with one of the 4 that were down there, and voila, our answer. Okay, now, before we start trying to find the critical values uh, of this first derivative and determining, uh, you know, what could be our relative max and mins, let's not forget, and I kind of, well, I didn't forget, but I haven't put it up here, up here yet. What is our reasonable domain? Well, this is our function in terms of x, and remembering that we have to make a right triangle, a reasonable domain, well, if my x comes in and, you know, basically, my reasonable domain starts at 2. Now, I can't have x equal to because then I'm just going to have a vertical line and I'll never intercept or intersect the, the, uh, the y-axis. And so if I was at like 2.01, that would just go rise and 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 take forever. Eventually, it would cross the y-axis, but it would probably be quite a long... Um, uh, yeah, uh-huh, hypotenuse. Okay, so my reasonable domain goes from 2, and then it can just extend on out for infinity. So I don't think it's reasonable to let x go out to infinity, but my reasonable domain for this function in this setting is from 2 to infinity. So now we need to find out where is this first derivative equal to 0, and where is this first derivative equal uh, becomes undefined for our critical values. Uh, but I can't fit all of that into this tiny little space. Let me step out again, clean out this board, uh, write, this, you know, write the first derivative in here somewhere, and leave some room to actually find those critical values and apply the, I don't know if I do the first derivative test or the second derivative test on here, but uh, you know, finish the problem. 
Okay, so we have all cleaned up here. <clears throat> Critical values. Where's the first derivative undefined? Well, <clears throat> I'm just going to do that first because that's the easiest. We have a denominator of x minus 2. So if x is equal to 2, that makes this denominator 0. That makes this first derivative undefined. And so my solution of where is this first derivative undefined? Well, that's x equals uh, 2. But 2 is not part of our reasonable domain, again, because we talked about how that wouldn't even form a triangle. So that's not a critical value. It's not within our domain. So our first derivative is equal to 0. OK, let's figure that out. So we have 2x minus 196x over x minus 2 cubed equals 0. OK, well, both of these terms have an x in them, right? So I can factor that x out. Actually, I can factor the 2 out as well, because that 196 is even. So factor out the 2x from these two terms, and we get 2x. 2x divided by 2x is 1, minus 196 divided by 2 is um, 2 times 9 is 18. So 9 <clears throat> leaves a remainder of 6, 1, and 16. So 98x over x minus 2 cubed equals, whoops, that x shouldn't be there, equals 0. OK, let me just make sure I didn't do something. So yeah, OK. So now we're going to, well, what makes this equal to 0? This factor could, could be equal to 0. So I'll set 2x equal to 0, and x is equal to, therefore, 0. And I divide both sides by 2. But 0, again, is not within our domain. So don't need to worry about that. Now we've got 1 minus 98 over x minus 2 cubed is equal to 0. We're going to move the, um, the 1 over to the other side and get, probably run out of room again. Negative 98 over x minus 2 cubed equals negative 1 because we moved it over with subtraction. We can divide both sides or multiply both sides by negative 1 and cancel that out. Now we got 98. Uh, let's multiply both sides by x minus 2 cubed to both sides. And we get 98 is equal to x minus 2 cubed. We're going to have to cube root both sides. And we get the cube root of 98 is equal to x minus 2. Move the 2 over. We get the cube root of x excuse me, of 98 plus 2 is our critical value of x. Now, right off the top of my head, uh, the cube root of 98 plus 2 is going to be approximately 6.1, or 6.61 is our approximate value for x. OK, so <clears throat> I'm out of room. We found a critical value. We don't know if it's a relative max or min. Uh, of course, we're trying to minimize the length, so hopefully it's a min, but we need to apply a test for that just to double check. We've got some more room. All right. <clears throat> so I set up my intervals from 2 to 6.61 and from 6.1 to uh, infinity. And beyond. Uh, plugged a test point of 3 into my first derivative and got a negative answer. A test point, I did 7 plugged it into my first derivative and got a positive answer. So if the function is decreasing and then starts to increase, then at 6.61, we have a relative min. It wasn't asking the problem, but I went ahead and found uh, the minimum uh, value of the function at 6.61, or the relative minimum value. But remembering that I really just let the function stay equal to c squared, uh, that gives us a hypotenuse that's approximately, when I square root that 144.431, of about 12.02. But the question and ask for the minimized length of the hypotenuse, make sure you do answer the question, it asked for the vertices. Okay, so we know what x is. The x is uh, right there, equal to 6.61. So now we're going to go over here and Remember all this work we did that related the vertices of x and y together. y is equal to 7x over x minus 2. So the y coordinate of our other vertice is equal to 7 
times our approximated value of x of 6.61 over 6.61 minus 2. And that is approximately, because these are rounded off decimals, equal to 10.04. So, I miss it true. I am. Go to your homework. Can't stop the video without a remote. <laughs> By the way, Sam, if you're watching again, thanks for this shirt too.